Thanks so much for joining me. Um, looking forward to this conversation. You guys have been innovating um, as a content provider, I think as a consumer facing organization, I think and as a uh, sort of seller uh, for a long time. So there's some interesting things we can talk about. But we should start with the consumer because that really is the most important uh, part of this equation. So where you guys sit, you know, what kinds of changes are you seeing in the way that consumers want to interact with your brands and with your content? Yeah, good question to start us off. I think we've been looking at this a lot, especially if you start getting into the storytelling for the next coming up front. And when we actually just took a step up and started to look at the big picture, 35 to well, more than that, 50 years ago, everything was transacted on the introduction of adults 18 to 49. And that was useful then, but also there was only three networks to transact on. And the US population was about half the size. Mm -hmm. So obviously, naturally things have changed pretty dramatically just by virtue of access and the number of people. Um, and I love the point you made about the millennials earlier because the way I was looking at it a little bit was, I think at some point it definitely was enough to just say generations were a way to target because there might've been some psychology, behavioral, mm -hmm. whatever it was around those types of people. But you could just see even the word millennial has, it's like a lightning rod. And I think I'm technically a millennial, but I don't like to classify that makes myself me feel as super one. Old, by the way. <laughs> well, I don't say the word basic. I don't use Snapchat. Thank I you. don't eat avocado toast. Have so you ever like... done anything on TikTok? <laughs> TikTok? Don't know what TikTok. No, I'm okay. just kidding. Um, so I think just by virtue of more access, more people, uh, more definition around who those people are and how you have to reach them, it just creates this natural evolution for change, and, and that's where we are now. Yeah, so then what does that end up meaning for the ad ecosystem? Like, how does it change the way that the buy and sell sides of the advertising supply chain need to need to operate? Yeah, I, th I think I also look at it from, when you look at the supply chain, right? There's consumers on both sides of us at NBC. Um, yeah. We have consumers that are engaging with our brands and our marketers, and they're changing. I think Christy did a great job of explaining how that has evolved. And then on the other side of us, it's how they're consuming our content. And we're sort of at the middle point of this marketing spectrum, and there's all this change that's happening between whether it's with the client and the agency, the agency and the publisher, yep. the publisher and the distributor. Um, there's a lot of pressure happening, and that's why right now it just makes so much sense for a pivot to happen in the marketplace where we finally maybe break through. Uh, but with that is a lot of complications because there's so many business models and legacy business models, multi-billion dollar business models that are in there. And everyone cares about only what's on either side of them, but it's sort of an equation that needs to balance out. So I think for the next few years, there's definitely gonna be a lot of uncomfortability that we're gonna have to get used yeah. to. Yeah, balance and tension with a lot of disruption. Yes. Right, we're, yes. we're out of balance. Yes. Um, but getting back in balance is gonna be disruptive. I think, yeah? For sure. So then um, let's talk a little bit about um, this notion of fragmentation and, and kind of how that has impacted the industry writ large, but certainly marketers, you know, your customers. I think a great way to look at it is, you know, some of the content that's being aired right now. Uh, we just had Eddie Murphy recently hosting SNL. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was great, he did a great job, but it's been 35 years since the last time he was on stage. Um, so that's a great juxtaposition of ways to look at behavior from then and now. Uh, oh my gosh, so I love using Eddie Murphy as a benchmark. <laughs> this is amazing, okay, go ahead. Um, well, 11 years, uh, 35 years ago, yep. it was about 19 million-ish impressions that he delivered. Okay. Viewership is up, and so that's one thing, like we need to just correct the perception that TV consumption is down, it's not. Viewership was up, it increased 65% from then to now. However, what you now see is that 62% of that consumption was happening from a non-live linear stream. Right. So DVR, on-demand streaming services. And so that fragmentation that is happening, it's happening naturally. Consumers are not saying, oh, I'm watching it differently suddenly. They're not thinking of a Nielsen watermark. They're not looking at it that way. They're looking at convenience, right? And so we have to keep accommodating that convenience. So what happened with Eddie Murphy's return? It was great. Um, it was up how much? 65%? 65% okay. increase in viewership. Okay, but mostly non- Two thirds of that non-linear. Live, right. okay, non-live, li that's amazing. Okay, so what does the marketer do with that information? <laughs> yeah, great, great question. Um, well, this is where I think, you know, it's, we have to figure out how we can build the, around the complexity. Um, I think if you look at the supply chain, um, it's starting to shrink. 
which is actually a good thing. There's more consolidation now than ever before. I think one thing, if I had a personal observation of the marketplace, is that there's been a lot of M&A recently. Um, and I know that because every time something happens, I have to spend a day and a half trying to figure out what that means for the industry, for my <laughs> bosses. So John Hochter, thank you very much wherever you're sitting. Um, and maybe if you can slow down for a little bit, um, that would help. Um, but with that comes uh, some positives in that we're not actually trying to accommodate that many more people, even on the publisher side. As we're converging, there's less decision makers in the room. And so that should lead to less friction as we try to evolve. I would like that to be true. Less friction should be a theme. Relatively speaking, like, of this if you week. think about how robust MarTech is right now, it is still very robust. I mean, we've got a room of vendors that's proof of that right now and all the great things you're all doing. So we have this level of technology, yet probably more consolidation than we've ever had before with that level of tech. Okay, so let's switch gears slightly and turn it back to MBCU. Great. So, you know, talk about some things that you guys are actually doing to sort of address all of this evolution that's happening. Yeah. Uh, it's probably best categorized in about three different ways because we're doing so much. But the first is we produce content. And we're producing more content than ever before just because of what we discussed you need to. Yeah. We're no longer bound by this linear television stream where if we want to put more than 24 hours a day, seven days a week of content, we need to add a new network. We have these different distribution pipes to put them in places. So we're, this year, 2020 alone, we're producing 110,000 hours of content. Okay. And so to put that into perspective, if Somebody decided to watch just TV straight through. That would take them about 12 years to watch. Wow. And the average consumer watches about six hours a day, so about 50 plus years to consume all that. Okay. Just in one year. Wow. The second but thing. How, like, how is that as compared with 10 years ago? Is it like a dramatic uptick? Sounds like it. Yeah, I, th I think this has, been, uh, this has been something that has continued yeah, to evolve. Totally. Yeah, totally. Um, second thing we're doing is around distribution. And so you start to see things like Peacock evolving, which yep. we're really proud of. And I think, you know, we just had our investor day where we announced a bunch of stuff a few weeks ago. And, um, you know, I think there's gonna be a great um, place for us in the market. You know, we, we like what's happening with the other streaming services they're showing. There is this demand there and we're ready to enter that marketplace. Um, and then the third thing is technology. And we have to keep building tech that supports all this fragmentation, all this demand, finding out where the consumer is, and so th that's where the introduction, uh, introduction of one platform comes out for NBC. Okay, what the heck is one platform? What the heck is Tell one platform? Tell us more. Okay. I'm setting you up, I wanna know. They wanna know. Yeah, we, we, we planned that. Um, <laughs> one platform is not something we decided yesterday, it's time to introduce one platform. One platform is sort of years of development and preparation and convergence, finally getting to a point where we're ready to do this in a more seamless, consolidated way. It, it, I think you mentioned what Disney had done, how they brought their portfolio together. That was something we had to do as well. So it started off, totally. bring TV together. Then it was, how do you bring digital together? How do you bring measurement together? We launched C-Flight, co-viewing. And so now we're at the point where we've had these different strategies of bringing things together from a structural standpoint, but also technology in the advanced advertising space with our AdSmart portfolio. And so the amalgamation of all of that have sort of unveiled one platform where you can have one plan, one optimization, one view, one measurement, and it okay. all comes together for Is advertising. Is the market ready for that? I, we would not have been doing this if at every year's upfront conversation starting at CES and rolling into CAN wasn't, we need this. Oh, those annoying buyers. No, all we love want. those buyers. I'm just kidding. Julie? Want, want, want. No, okay, so that's great. So then there is not just, I guess my question is, there's not just an appetite, but there's an ability to take advantage of? There's a need. I, I think a few years ago, we might have had the excuse, well, you know, agencies are bifurcated, budgets are here and here for digital and TV, programmatic's over there. If we brought it all together, they wouldn't buy that way anyway. Now you're seeing, as we're getting ready to have the conversations with these clients, they're actually telling us in advance, no, this is actually how we want it. Okay, um, so then talk about this notion, that we've been talking a bit over today, and I'm sure we will continue, uh, around kind of interoperability, kind of connectivity, um, feels like a thing we need, feels hard to get to, how do we do it? Yes, interoperability, yeah. Um, so for me, interoperability is one of the reasons why you know, I'm at NBCU. Uh, if you started off many years ago when we launched uh, an API on top of our TV traffic system so we could launch programmatic television and our, fr our friends at Target and Roundel were some of the first to actually participate in that program. Everything we've been building around that on top of that has all been with this philosophy that we believe there needs to be an interoperable ecosystem for television. For whatever reason, even though NBCU reaches 97% of the country, 
agencies don't count, consider us like they might consider Facebook or Google individually within their agency. We're still TV. And so we're only as good as the collection of the TV partners we have around us. Huh. And so if that's the case, uh, at least it's my opinion that in order for this to truly scale for all of us to continue to make transacting easier on television, we need to be able to be interoperable. And one platform is going to have a roadmap towards interoperability and automation, uh, but we do have components right now that do have that, whether it's our digital programmatic stack and what we've done with programmatic television. We're in uh, initiatives like Project OR and OpenAP. Yep. And so all this is with this future state in mind where not only do we want to make it easier for the bigger holding companies to be able to transact with us, but there's a wealth of businesses that I think maybe five, 10 years ago, if they wanted to advertise on NBC, we would have said, no, thank you. Right now we're doing about 100, we're working with about 150 D to C brands now. And Holy cannoli. through automation, we're able to take deal sizes at like $15,000. Wow, and okay. Maybe that's not a lot for some people, but in totality, that adds up, and that's, I think, what some of the digital companies have been really great at. That's so fascinating. Yeah, the interoperability thing feels so important, and, and uh, initiatives that have been launched in the past, I'm waiting for them to take hold. And so part of it is, you know, is it an urgency question? Like, did we just not feel the urgency before? And that's where why we're still sort of talking about this after a couple of years? I think one of the points that you can observe in the marketplace that supports this th this concept or yep. philosophy is that if you look at each holding company, you know, part of that supply chain and the and the changes we're seeing on the consumer from the consumers, they're all coming up with their own data strategy because yep. they need to continue to show value for their clients. But no one is going to say let's all align against the same data strategy. They're competing against each other. So there is bespoke philosophies within each agency and holding company. And so for us, why would we create a wallier uh, playground um, that they need to plug into rather than just say, hey, what if we just figured out that, you know, we can plug in with each of you, however you need. Tell us what your preference is, and especially as they're acquiring all these data companies now, we need to be able to seamlessly plug in, at least from a, from a technical development perspective, it's just not efficient to do it one off each time. Right. Well, maybe it's not NBCU versus, versus Disney. No. It is how do NBCU and Disney serve as part of a larger whole of a, of a client's strategy? Because that is the reality. That is what's happening, yeah? For sure. Yeah. I, I think that's some of the spirit behind OpenAP. Yeah. You know, we're mean, we're yeah. there now with uh, some fellow publishers, and we welcome more. Um, I think we're trying to figure out how does perhaps OpenAP become a place that you can look to to help consolidate all of that feedback and start to create more standards for how we can each engage separate from each of our own initiatives and efforts. Yeah. Let's talk about it. I mean, you know, we had a, um, a, a very senior agency person um, with a man bun make a comment <laughs> earlier about being able to use you know, an audience definition in more than one place and not having to have 65 audience definitions. Yeah. How far are we from that? How far are we from the industry enabling, you know, a very senior agency person to be able to do that? We're there now for, for certain activation paths. Okay. Uh, it's not too dissimilar from programmatic digital, right? Uh, with programmatic television, and at least with our instance of that, and the different vendors that are out there, they're setting up a single audience and they're pushing it through to the different suppliers. Um, but even when it comes with OpenAP, where they're trying to support the managed service business, which is where most and majority of the spend and transactions are happening, mm -hmm. it should be as simple as I can just share with you a Boolean line of, of, of data and definition so that you can transact on that. It shouldn't need to be, I need to redefine a Polk segment every time I go to a different publisher. That just seems too simple to not already be able to do. And yet, you look at me like you're blaming me. And yet, no, I'm actually not. You seem enthusiastically attuned toward a toward a different kind of future. So, and yet, I'm looking at everybody else. I now we're out of time. Now you all have to talk about how you're going to fix it. Yeah. I think the hard part for us is over. Now it's up to them. Yeah, to it's answer. up to them now. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs>